Hey guys, it's Robert Mays from The Athletic Football Show. We feel like one of the stories of the season so far on this show has been pass protection rules and defense's ability to manipulate them. So I wanted to welcome one of our good friends here at The Athletic Football Show, someone who understands pass protection rules and how they work better than pretty much anyone you could ever ask about this. All pro NFL offensive mind and Super Bowl champion, Mitchell Schwartz is here to help us sort through some pass protection problems that NFL offensive lines have to sort through. Mitch, really appreciate you doing this and for helping us learn some stuff today. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. You know, this is the stuff I love talking about. I love teaching. Twitter <laughs> isn't quite the right for format to do that. And so getting onto YouTube and doing it in a longer form where you can show the videos and talk slowly and break it down, I think is going to be a lot of fun. All right. I wanted to start with this play for a specific reason. We're looking at this. You have an overload front to one side of the offensive line. And there's a linebacker walked up into the B-gap over the right guard. Defenses around the NFL use this pretty consistently. Another team that I can explicitly remember doing a lot of this this season is Miami. So I wanted to ask you, as somebody who has to deal with it, why this is something that defenses are going to pretty often. Yeah, it's definitely something that you've seen a lot more over the last few years. You know, from my playing career, this was more of a Seattle Seahawks look, and it's now gotten, you know, driven around the league, especially as those, as those coaches have gone elsewhere. And of course, Salah is well, from... Salah, obviously, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you said this is an overload look. And for people who are watching, what that means is there are three defense alignment on one side of the line of scrimmage on one side of the center. Um, so typically, in, as an offense alignment, as you're breaking the huddle, you know it's a pass play. What you're trying to determine is how many big guys, how many rushers there are on the field. So typically, that's three or four in these third down situations. Occasionally, that's five. But you're breaking the huddle, you're going to the line, and you're saying, all right, four down, four down. There's clearly, in this picture, four guys with their hands on the ground. Now, typically, the way they're aligned is two on each side of the center, and they can be, you know, in different alignments. You're obviously your defensive ends are going to be outside the tackles, but those two defensive tackles uh, can be really anywhere in those three uh, guard center spots. In this particular look, you've got three guys to the offense's left, but as we're looking at it here on the right side of the screen, and that's what an overload is. And so that puts stress on the offensive line. The center there, you know, that defensive tackle is off his frame. That's a decently long way to go, having to snap the ball, having to shimmy over there. You know, the left guard has a guy who's, again, outside of his frame, and the left tackle has a very wide defensive end. Now, part of that is the Packers <laughs> uh, historically have very wide splits, uh, <laughs> which as an offensive tackle I love. But this overload look can cause some havoc because you're basically going to have one-on-ones there and they can run any combination of games out of that. You know, they can have the two defensive tackles go up the field, loop the defensive end around. They can do, you know, defensive end and that, you know, three tech defensive tackle can go inside. They can loop the guy over the center all the way around. Um, the guy over the center can quickly cross face on the center. You know, there's so many things you can do out of that look. And, and for the most part, you're getting one-on-ones. And so, like you said, what NFL teams have started to do is they take a linebacker, in this case, number 57, C.J. Mosley, and they put him essentially as a stand-up three-tech over the opposite guard. So now you've got four down linemen, but you're giving a bear a five-down look where everybody's covered across the board. And why teams like that is it takes the right guard away from being able to help on a slide to the left. You know, in a perfect world, what you'd say is, Right tackle, you're one-on-one -on -one with the defensive end, and now we have four more offensive linemen to block three defensive linemen. Well, the best way to do that is to have a four-man slide to the left and bring the right guard down, and now the Jets can do all sorts of crazy things with their defensive line, but the Packers have an extra guy there to help clean up, to help block it. You know, if that D-tackle crosses the center's face immediately, well, that's the right guard's guy. He's right there. 57 changes the equation. He's forcing, for the most part, the offensive line to go five down to make a bear call and to treat him as a defense alignment. And that means everybody across the board now has one-on-one -on -one blocks. If you don't block it that way, what you're doing is you're making your running back, number 33, Aaron Jones in this case, step up and block a bigger guy, uh, a stronger guy, basically at the line of scrimmage. And that's usually a mismatch and that favors the defense. So the way the offense counters it, you take your offense alignment, you put them on that stand-up linebacker in the three-tech spot, and now you've gained a massive advantage on that overload side that all three of those guys are on one-on-one -on -one island blocks. It seemed, it's a simple way from an outside observer 
to give yourself advantages on the defense. You're not leveraging yourself really in any way because that three technique linebacker, he can easily drop out. So let's look at how this play unfolds when the ball is actually snapped and what the ramifications of it can be. Because I think one of the biggest advantages that these teams are getting, you'll see it in this picture, by occupying the right guard with that linebacker, we're seeing these offensive lines waste a blocker consistently because even if that linebacker is dropping out four out of five times, that one time you have to account for him. So the right guard here, who I believe is Royce Newman, number 70, he's blocking no one as there are a bunch of one-on-ones happening on the other side of the line. And the Jets went to this a ton in this game against the Packers. It was incredibly efficient. It was incredibly effective. And I think this is a perfect example of why this is a problem for offensive lines as they have to deal with this exact look. Yeah, and in this shot, you can see 98. It looks like he's running a bit of a game coming over the top of 95. You would love for the right guard to be there to solidify it. You know, the center is probably in position to make that block. You know, his hips are flipped the opposite way, but he can make that block. Now, can he stone him at the line, flatten him off, and give Rodgers a clean interior pocket where he can step up and drive a pass? I'm not exactly sure. I do know if 70 was there and he was staring 98 down, he'd go attack him with physicality and the middle of the pocket would be dead. It'd be solidified. And that's exactly what you want as a quarterback to have that middle of the pocket solidified. And so this is a a very easy and simple way we've seen teams across the league utilize scheme to their advantage. All right. This one I wanted to break down. I was I was very interested in what the Ravens pressure looks would look like after they brought Roquan Smith into the equation because he's so much more comfortable dropping than a guy like Patrick Queen is. So I'm curious how the communication would look if you're sitting there as the center or any of these guys along the offensive line, what you're looking at here before the snap, the pre-snap picture, and what the conversation and dialogue is because of it. And you go to the line of scrimmage, you try to figure out how many down rushers there are, how many defensive ends, how many big guys. In this look, it looks like there's four defensive linemen. So you're walking to the line, you're saying four down, four down. And so it's a four down look with two linebackers in the box. On the left side of the screen here, this is again an overload look. We can see Calais Campbell, and we have two defensive ends who are outside of the left tackle. That's three of your big guys, and then the fourth is way outside on the hash over the right tackle. So on this play, you've identified three big guys on the left side of the screen, one big guy on the right side of the screen, and two off-the-ball linebackers. So it looks like what the Saints are doing is making a four-man slide to the left. So the right guard is the uncovered lineman. You've got the overload on the left. He's being called down to join a slide to the left. And Kamara is left with 18 Roquan Smith as his first threat. You can see his eyes are to the right and his first movement post-snap are to the right, looking like he's checking him out. And it seems like he's got a bit of a tell that 18 isn't blitzing. You know, Kamara could zip across the formation and pick that guy up, but he's not. It seems like, you know, that guy's going to drop into coverage. From the offensive line perspective, it's a four-man slide to the left, and so 78 the center knows it's an overload to the left, and there's a linebacker in his A-gap to the right. And where they go wrong is as 93 Calais Campbell crosses the center's face, he's supposed to know that, hey, I've got the right guard here helping me. I can let him go. You know, you know, don't just let a big man like Calais Campbell run scot-free into your guard, <laughs> but I can help him over to the guard, and I'm still an A-gap to the left blocker i still have to have responsibility and it seems like he gets so caught on calais campbell part of that again might be because he's the biggest human in the nfl and his (laughs) eyes can't track queen over the top coming from the opposite side uh, of the center and he ends up just losing sight of him and so that's the key breakdown here the fact that uh, the center on a slide to the left gets too caught up on the defensive tackle crossing his face and then the linebacker coming from the opposite side he, he just doesn't see him. He gets caught. This is a really nice game from Baltimore. And again, a good way to rush four guys, not really do anything too crazy, and gain a tactical advantage. So you put all those things together, and it sounds really complicated, and it is. And this is the result. You've got a guy who just gets too trapped on a defensive tackle. His eyes aren't in the right place. And then you have a pick on a guard, and the guy's able to get to the quarterback. Is there anything that the left guard and the left tackle can do in that situation? Or because he's coming scot-free with all that momentum and he's ear-holing the left guard as part of that twist, they're really just, we're screwed. There's no way you can recover unless the running back senses that like, hey, someone screwed up. Six should not be running this free and I'm just going to stay in here. And you can see Kamara actually start to do that. 
But once Six buries himself into the left guard, Kamara now thinks, all right, we're good. So Kamara theoretically could save the play. I would say his eyes, everything he's seeing, what he trusts of his line is correct. He's trying to help out where he can and then get out into the route. You know, we just talked about not wasting running backs and you definitely wouldn't want to waste them when their blitz threat isn't coming. You don't want to have a running back sitting in there and blocking for guys who are supposed to be blocking or helping out too long on chips. Uh, the main breakdown here is the center. And so the right guard should be trying to shove the center off to the left. He should be saying, go, 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 go. It's so funny that sometimes the simple answer of why are offensive linemen having harder time dealing with stunts? Because defensive lines are better at running stunts now. <laughs> it's just sometimes it's just as simple as that. All right, this one I love. I, I We don't mm -hmm. have to spend a ton of time on this, but I just think that obviously it's always fun to see an alignment where you know that the defensive coordinator is just trying to fuck whatever with whatever the rules are. <laughs> we talked about this coming into it when we did the first one, all right? You look at who are the four rushers, who are the big guys that we as an offensive line have to worry about. This play is from the Bucks win over the Seahawks in week 10. They did this a couple times. The first time in this game that they ran this exact look, Seahawks burned a timeout because they're staring at this and Geno Smith's looking at it and saying, well, all right, we have two off-ball linebackers who are now lined up as defensive ends outside of the tackles. Our two stand-up linebackers are lined up over the guards off the ball. If you're looking at this exact defensive alignment, but how does this set off some communication with the offensive line? Well, the offensive line, again, you're, you're breaking the huddle. Hey, four down, four down. You understand there's four defensive linemen. There's two you know, linebackers, off-ball guys traditionally, and that's how you're going to identify the defensive front. And this is where I think this defensive front is especially uh, smart. You're looking at two rookie offensive tackles. So you've got two yeah. guys that potentially have never seen this look before. If they have, they've only had it a few times in their career. Whereas a veteran team, you know, if I was out there, I'd be turning back to the quarterback. Hey, you know, four down. We got two guys inside, two guys inside. And the easy way to do this is, all right, your four offensive linemen are going to track those four guys. And then you just make a normal call. You know, you could mic 54 who's on the right side of the screen outside of the right tackle and you could slide the line to the left. So in that case, you know, 63, the center would be going left. He'd have 56 left guard would have nine left tackle would have 45 and the right side. They would again track their two true big guys. So they would have the A and B gap rushers. You leave 54 for the running back if he blitzed and seems pretty simple. Communicate to the running back, communicate to the quarterback. But in this instance, going against two rookies, you know, you're in a different country. Things are already weird already. Um, <laughs> this is a pretty simple way to give them something they might have never seen. This might be a literal career unscouted look that they've never encountered before and to try to throw them off. And in this case, force them to take a timeout. What we see from the Seahawks right side of the offensive line is actually something I would not advise in this particular look. And if you're not sliding to the left, which it looks like they're sliding to the left, both the left guard and the center are holding out their left hand, uh, which I believe is identifying to the running back, hey, we're going to slide to this side. You have the linebacker on the other side. The right guard and right tackles should just be locked in on the big guys. So no bother setting out. Don't waste any footwork. Don't waste any time. What it looks like is they're almost trying to play out which of the two uh, guys are going to come. And in this case, I don't think you should do that. You know, this isn't empty protection. The running back isn't out where one guy would make you hot. This is a case where they should just, like I said, hey, 60, I got 59, 72, I got the three tech and we're just going to block them because you can see the right tackle in particular, he puts himself in a bit of a bad position by setting out. He's a little bit late coming back to the three tech. And they get lucky that there's no contain, but he's a little bit loose and, you know, Gino is forced to flush from the pocket. So they took the timeout. They went to the line, uh, to the sideline. They talked about it. I'm not sure they came up with the best solution to have the right side sort this, you know, this is a six man protection with the running back. So I think you want to track your four guys. You want to slide in this case to the left side and the right guard and the right tackle should be setting down on the big guys immediately from the snap. All right, guys, that's all we got. Thank you for spending a little bit of time with us today, digging into the nitty gritty of some pass protection rules and some fun examples from the first half of the season. We will be back with more fun nuts and bolts football stuff here on the Athletic Football Show. We'll talk to you guys soon.